Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming to the second in the in the series this winter, and uh, I'm really glad to have and excited to have with us um, Jared Zafman and Steve Turner. I'm not going to spend long introducing them, but I should probably let you know just a little bit about both of them. For those of you who don't know, um, they are not just new city councillors, and not even that new anymore. It probably feels like you've been in office for a little while now. Um, so it, Jared is uh, Ward 14 councillor for the City of London. Um, Steve Turner is Ward 11 councillor. Um, they were both elected last October. They're also both grads of our MPA program. Uh, Jared graduated in 2012 and Steve in 2013. Um, and other than that, they both have actually a lot and interesting and varied experience to bring on what they're doing now in council. Um, Jared, after he graduated from our MPA program, worked as a municipal administrator for a couple of years. First in St. Mary's, right? Stratford. First in Stratford, um, in the mayor's office, um, and then in economic development in St. Mary's. Um, and now he's working in, um, I think it's uh, public policy, right, for the Parkinson's Society um, of Ontario. Um, and. And Steve is a paramedic by training and by profession, uh, but he's also spent, before he, he brought on council, he spent several years, or I'd say quite a few years, working in uh, community activism and community uh, politics in the city of London. For a time, he was the president of the Urban League, uh, which is an association of neighborhood associations, as it were, in the city. Uh, did I describe it about right? Yeah. Okay. It's an umbrella group. We represent 29 neighborhood yeah. associations. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I'm delighted to welcome them here today. Uh, I've left the agenda open for them with a sort of very broad title. So uh, uh, I'm sure they're gonna have some very interesting things to say about their experience on council and moving into that role. And uh, then we'll have some time for discussion. So please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Martin. Really appreciate it. Jared and I uh, put words on a few slides and really have no idea how this is going to go. It's uh, uh, very loose and, uh, and we'll, we'll talk and, and as, uh, as questions come up at the end, uh, we're going to be more than happy to talk about that because that's probably where we're at our best. <laughs> All right. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I think for Steve and I that we wanted to chat a little bit about um, was, you know, the difference both Steve and I had run uh, in past elections uh, unsuccessfully, but both strong attempts, I would say. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the major differences was that when we both ran this time, um, we had MPAs under our belt and have gone through the education experience. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the questions that uh, we've gotten a few times and I think is sort of an interesting one to talk about um, is, you know, having run before and successfully, um, you know, what's having the MPA this time? Did it make a difference? You know, uh, what sort of interaction did that have um, when we were campaigning? Um, so I don't know if you want to start that one on. Yeah, uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of night and day, actually. Uh, in, I ran in 2006, and because I was relatively unknown, and it, it didn't read very well on my pamphlets, the, the kind of experience that I had. Uh, and, uh, I relied very heavily on endorsements from other people to kind of speak to what I had done. Uh, in this past round, I uh, decided I'm just going to stand on my own with it and uh, list of qualifications and included the, uh, the local government program in, in, at Western and the MPA. And uh, the reception on the door is people read that piece and they said, well, are you qualified? I was right here. I am. In fact, I, I spent a, a few years uh, studying municipal government and, and really getting a sense of it. Uh, the other part is on my day job, I'm the Deputy Chief of Emergency Medical Services for Oxford County. So when I got into the MPA program, it was really with dual purposes. One, because I, I as, a, as a municipal administrator, I watched, especially when you look at the police, fire, and EMS uh, uh, services themselves, they're very much populated by people who have spent enough time in the job and just kind of move up eventually, but they haven't really learned. I'm a paramedic, right? Uh, so what does a paramedic know about running a $10 million budget? 
or administrating administering an IT uh, uh, component or program management or development, those kind of things. Not necessarily a lot. So to see people advance through the field with that training, uh, we needed to see it populate a little bit better. So I saw the same thing on the, the local government side in terms of uh, elected officials. Uh, and, and if you study the, uh, the political theory component about uh, the urban reform movement, they, one of the impetuses for the urban reform movement was non-professional politicians, uh, and they wanted to see a, a higher caliber of representatives. So, uh, if you if you're from London, you knew what happened the last four years, uh, and, and the question of professionalism on council. Uh, you know, so for me, it was it was I think uh, a little bit of a different take. So when I ran uh, originally in 2010. Um, you know, I was 23, and uh, I was fairly happy with the success that I had. Um, but one of the things that I felt at the end of the election was, um, realistically, I, I looked at the council of the day, um, who was there, and what experience they had. And my frustration, I think, sort of Steve alluded to this, was that no one really on council um, had a good background understanding of municipal government management or government management in general. Um, and so that really pushed me a lot. Um, you know, a bit of my reasoning for pursuing the NPA um, was that if I ever was to, to try that again, um, you know, actually having that background and understanding um, and, and real basis of how to how government manage and work in administration um, would go a, a significant long way. Um, not only in terms of the campaign, um, but you know, if I was to win, that you know, going into the position, I'd have a much fuller understanding, be able to do the job. Uh, in a much better way, even when I, you know, I was confident in what I would do, you know, five years ago, um, but it really gave me that, that fuller confidence uh, to do the job the best I could. Um, and I think, similar to Steve, you know, running this time, having the MPA um, on my, you know, on my pamphlets, um, people very much appreciated that because it was, you have an actual education and understanding of what the job is that you're supposed to be doing, rather than just simply having a genuine interest in trying to do well for the city, um, which is, you know, a huge component of it as well. Um, but actually having that professional aspect to it. And then on top of that, you know, having the opportunity after the MPA to go and work with city government of Stratford um, and really gain some more substantial experience in working in the municipal government um, and trying to bring that experience of, of working on the staff side um, to becoming uh, on the political side of things, um, I think went a long way and people really appreciated having both of those uh, perspectives uh, when seeing uh, me as a potential candidate. So I think for both of us, I think it was a very positive experience. So uh, we took a look, really, it, it's fascinating to, to go through all of the program components of the MPA uh, program and curriculum, uh, the MPA and the DPA program, both of them, and how do those align with, with what do we do uh, at City Hall as counselors, uh, what do we do in our day jobs too, but really as counselors, uh, these things were, were significant factors. We just finished uh, going through our budget, uh, budget uh, for the City of London is about a billion dollars and a lot of moving parts to it. So to be able to to go through the budget and and, uh, and dissect it, dissect a billion dollars, it's our first exposure to the city's budget, uh, uh, and, and find the right pieces, making sure that, uh, that programs are funded to, uh, to the point that they need to be funded, that we're not uh, looking for service reductions, uh, but that the services that we provide are the appropriate services, that really took a, a program evaluation lens, uh, and the uh, municipal finance uh, components I, I think were, were fairly significant. One of the neat things we just uh, looked at uh, the other night, uh, last week at council, was a, um, a memorandum of understanding on uh, a public nonprofit partnership with the YMCA and the library to build a new facility, a multi-use recreational facility. Uh, going through that MOU, was a project that Kelly Coulter had given us in finance to go through and review an MOU uh, of a city and a Y working together to, to build a multi-use recreational facility. So I, I was like, wow, <laughs> this is so bizarre <laughs> because uh, I, you know, you get these kind of test things and uh, uh, well, I mean, what greater test is there than a, a $40 million facility uh, in real life and uh, you're playing with your money now. <laughs> so, <laughs> very useful, very helpful. Uh, and just to touch on that, I think, you know, when we were, for me, uh, you know, looking at the budget, um, one of the nice things about it was, you know, having that background in the MPA and doing the finance setting, um, you know, it's, you know, there is a theoretical aspect, but, you know, for many, I think, people on council, um, you know, us from the past, 
um, haven't necessarily had the opportunity to really go through you know a budget process like that. Um, you know, you might have some experience personal budgeting, whether it's through your business or whatnot. Um, but you get to the point where it's uh, something like municipal government, and you know the budget is something very different. Uh, it functions very differently, um, and being able to you know go through the budget uh, service by service, department by department, as well as line by line. In certain times, um, you know, we I don't think without having this background experience, really would not be able to do it um, in as good of a light that we did. I think this time, and uh, you know, I think that background really helped us a long way in making sure that you know we did that as prudent as we possibly could. Um, and I think we are much better for it. Um, I think you know one of the other things that uh, which I definitely enjoyed from the MBA program was the uh, you know uh, it's not it's not a full degree in municipal law, um, but at least one course to sort of get you started along your way. Um, and you know we've uh, we've already had to have some experiences uh, with some road widenings um, and that sort of thing, and dealing with some potential appropriations. Um, and you know, having uh, the understanding and background that we learned at least through this program, I know for me it gave me a much more comfortable place to be at um, when looking at those decisions, um, having a better understanding um, of the law around it and how it would proceed and how we can uh, deal with those situations. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a ton of moving parts with municipal finance, and so the as Jared said, the program here gives you a survey of it, and then delve into it and, and there's a lot more depth to it but uh, understanding the reserves and, and how reserves move and how the, the, uh, uh, the financial cycle uh, uh, all the well actually I guess uh, they said of us we did the budget in about half the time that to the previous council had done the budget so uh, there was a, a lot of us uh, that uh, Jesse Helmer is also an MPA grad from Queens so we don't talk about him too much but <laughs> 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 and Josh was certainly there to help. You know, <laughs> did a couple things as well. Uh, there, there are a number of masters. I, I think Harold has a masters, and Paul has a masters degree. Uh, the the academic level of this council is uh, is pretty high, and uh, that was really reflected in, in the debate over the budget. So I, I think we were fairly effective there. So you know, one thing um, that uh, talked to Melissa about. Um, was uh, uh, the fact that you know going through the MPA program? Um, one thing that I noticed and that there was some notice of was that um, you know my interest was from a uh, I was interested in, in the general administrative aspect of it, um, but I was also interested in the political side of things and how that interacted. Um, and one of the things that didn't necessarily come out specifically um, in the MPA program, um, which I think you know may be a benefit sometime in the future, um, is a bit more understanding of that council staff relationship and how that functions. Um, because you know when you're going forward, even as someone that wants to be a, an administrator, uh, you know having an understanding of how that relationship can function, hurt or help, I think goes a, a very long way. Um, and I know even for someone like myself, having an interest um, in in being a political representative, um, but having worked for the city of Stratford to begin with, um, you know, I didn't necessarily have um, any strong idea of how to sort of go about that or, or how that might affect me in my day to day job. Um, and I think. Um, for, for Steve, I know he's you know, had that experience for a bit longer than I have. Um, you know, it's, it's a fairly fine balance in trying to understand how that work, that work balance can go. Um, but I think, you know, having had the opportunity uh, myself just for a little while um, to, to really get and understand from the staff's perspective um, the potential of having a positive working relationship with council um, really went a long way for me and has really sort of started to help um, in my term on council this year, um, trying to uh, really make sure that that relationship is positive. I, I think this the program certainly gave us a strong empathy uh, for our colleagues on the administrative side of the, the horseshoe uh, to be able to understand the amount of work that goes into preparing a council report. Uh, myself, I have to prepare council reports at work in my day job and prepare for the politicians to digest and consume and debate. Debate, and then I, I leave work and I go to council, and then. I get count, uh, staff reports, and I then start poking holes in it. <laughs> and, uh, and but uh, I'm a little softer on them because I understand what it's like to have written one about an hour before. Um, <laughs> the uh, but it's a strange, strange dynamic. In fact, actually, the, the, our, our director in, in my department, uh, as I was writing one, she goes, "Well, you have to understand how the counselors think." <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Let me put that hat on for a second. Um, 
kind of an ironic statement, but uh, the but the difficulty, and, and Jared's got this up on the slide here, is that we may know and have a little bit more insight uh, than, than a couple colleagues, uh, and, and so we have to be careful uh, that we don't delve into the micromanagement component of uh, what we do. The city's administrators and, and the administrative arm of, of civic, civic government are the ones who deliver the programs day to day. Our job is to set the strategy, set the overarching component to say, these are the things we'd like to see delivered. Staff, figure out how we're going to do that. And then staff come back and say, these are our issues in doing that. And we're like, oh, OK. So <laughs> I guess we can't do that. Um, or we say, let's try and figure out a way to do it. The issues in the past, uh, last last term, and, and not to slag on our, our predecessors by any means, but we'll do it every once in a while. Uh, there was a, a reconstruction of the lobby of City Hall uh, in the last term to create it more service friendly. Awesome idea. That would be an initiative that council the council wants to do. Say, make City Hall more friendly to people who walk in. Make sure that they get the services they need without having to. Okay, go to the fifth floor, and then go to the third floor, and then after that, you got to go up to the ninth floor. Somebody at the front desk should be able to help navigate through that, that piece, and, and the lobby of City Hall should be welcoming. Perfect concept. Then they start talking about the tile colors, and then council, not not staff. <laughs> they say, well, and I don't think it it should be divided this way. They start playing with the floor plan. That's not the council's job. That's the staff job to do. Council's job is to say we want the lobby more service friendly, and this is how much money you have to do it. So we have to be ever conscious of that, and uh, I think every once in a while we kind of fall into there a little bit, and we have to kind of remind ourselves we'll pull back. This is what the last guys did. If I might just jump in there, I think in general, I think for you know, as as the council, because you're trying to get direction for the city as a whole, it's very easy to sort of fall into the role of trying to be that micromanager because you want things to go as positively in, in a way that you want it to. Um, but you know, I think for us, it's there's there's two parts to that. One is in general, I think that's everyone's interest is trying to recognize that um, and wanting everything to go in the best way possible. And sometimes getting to that micromanagement scale is fairly easy. Um, but I think even more so for any of us that have gone through the MPA program, um, you know, I think we think, and also having you know our own municipal background as staff. Um, you know, we have our own sort of experience and, and opinions about how maybe something should go. Um, and it really, I think, takes a lot, you know, for us to make sure that we're putting that aside and saying, you know, understanding our role specifically. And, and yet, you know, I think we should know almost best because we have that understanding of where that council staff relationship and role really uh, divide is. Um, and then I think one point that I, you know, I touched on a little bit earlier, um, but it had become fairly clear, um, you know, through the media, um, through talking to different people when we were campaigning, um, that over the past four, eight years, um, the general environment that had, uh, that had been created at City Hall um, had really been just worked into not necessarily the most positive of, of working environments. Um, and largely because you had a, a council and staff that rather than trying to work together in the best interest of the city, um, or sort of working against each other at odds ends. Um, and really, you know, I think for, for me, as I said in the past, but um, coming, having the opportunity to work as a staff person, but also getting to go through the MPA program and get to learn from so many people that had come from so many different municipalities and hearing about different experiences about their relationships with their own council, it was very clear to me at that point forward, um, staff, myself, anybody else on council, we may not necessarily always agree, and we may push for things to get changed in a different way. We may want to do something different and put something into a different direction. Um, but making sure that there's always that positive environment there, and that it's not, you know, a fighting environment. It's not uh, we're not at odds ends, um, but that it's a working relationship that we can build. Um, because I think for us on council, you know, that's the same thing I think that we think amongst each other is we're working ultimately to one goal, and that's to better the city of London. Um, and the staff is there to help that. And I think having the recognition of that is, is really significant. And I think something we're working hard to try and, and change, at least in an environmental status at City Hall. And there's a, a very palpable shift in the dynamic between council and staff uh, from the previous term to this one. Uh, they gave us uh, a very palpable budget to work with. Uh, they had done a lot of hard work, uh, brought in the budget at 2.9%. Uh, we had all said, uh, for the most part, when we took a look at our, our, our 13 other colleagues, uh, at 
basically said inflation was our target. Uh, inflation for 2014 uh, in Ontario was averaged at 2.4 percent. So they came in at a number, and we ended up at uh, 2.5 percent. It didn't take a lot of work to get there. We spent a lot of time trying to find the right places, but at the end of it, we maintained service. It was very much a keep the lights on budget, uh, but it was it was set there uh, very much because they worked hard because they wanted us to look good, uh, and we want them to look good too. And when they bring programs to us, the programs reflect uh, our, our philosophical uh, desires for where the city is going to go. They've kind of read that uh, through the campaign, and it's reflected in, in policy that's coming forward. Now we're doing the strategic plan process. So council has uh, spent a ton of time working on the strategic plan, and staff have spent a lot of time in tandem with that. Uh, they digested, they met with us uh, individually over the course of uh, uh, between election and us taking office uh, to get a sense of what our priorities were, what did we campaign on, what were the things that uh, that were huge issues for us that we wanted to see tackled in our term. They boiled that all down and took all of that together and created uh, a framework for us to work from and then uh, presented that to us and said, here's the common threads uh, amongst your campaigns. Uh, do these visions and strategic platform, uh, strategic uh, planks, what do they call it, pillars, uh, reflect your objectives as, as councillors. Do you see anything that's missing from what you campaigned on? Uh, and so some of the critique of it has been it seems like it's a very staff-driven process, our strategic planning process, uh, but it was very much uh, drawn from what our platforms were, and I don't think there's anything that's missing uh, of significant uh, pieces from our platforms, do you? No. Um, so underneath all of that, staff went and found the programs they were working on and they're developing and put them in underneath those strategic headlines and said, these programs are the ones we've got in the can that we're developing. Do those seem consistent with those? Because these are how we can help you execute your, your, uh, your strategic desires. Uh, that's the part that's getting the critique. It says, oh, this looks like it's a staff-driven plan because these are all staff projects. They're trying to align their components with us. And uh, I, I can understand the, uh, the concerns with it, but I think, uh, I think the process has been very positive. A little different than what we've done in school, uh, if you do your strat plan with, uh, with Ursula. Uh, it, uh, the, the, I guess the academic method of going through your, your strat planning, uh, some components were there, a lot of the components weren't there. So it was a little theoretically different. So just move on a little bit. We're talking about the strategic priorities. Um, you know, I think one of the interesting things for, for uh, all of us on council, um, and I know this for myself as well, and I appreciate uh, Martin asking this question because I think it's a good one to talk about. Um, you know, you as a private, us, me as a private citizen, me campaigning, um, before even, you know, uh, starting to campaign, you know, I think we individually have our own different ideas about, you know, where we want to see the city, what priorities matter more. Um, to us, you know, what, what is more significant. Um, and I think, you know, I think we recognize that when you take on the role of a counselor, um, sometimes when you're looking at different priorities, you can't, you know, you have to measure and weigh many different things. And although sometimes you, you have your own personal ideas and opinions about where you'd like something to go, and you can definitely take those forward, um, there's many things to balance, and, and one of them definitely is, you know, staff opinions. Um, and that's huge, and I think, for a lot of us when we're looking at the street of priorities, um, you know, the city and, and this is council, we have staff and they're there as experts and they're there for that reason to give us expert advice. Um, and the really tricky thing is trying to balance that expert advice uh, with citizen input and interest as well as, you know, where I think as a council we see that direction of wanting to go for the city. Um, and I think, you know, we've had, we definitely had some challenges, um, definitely around, you know, some community grant asks, that was definitely significant and I think um, really made us put that, that council hat on and make sure that we were balancing and weighing out these different options. Um, because that can be a challenge, but I think for all of us going into that role, recognizing that simply that's the difficulty of this job, um, and that's what we signed up for. And I think uh, one of the different things I think which I appreciate about this council so far, at least from the past, um, is that understanding that we're there to make tough decisions. And you know, one of the we had uh, recently with uh, planning this week, uh, the South Street Hospital lands. And, you know, that's a really, really uh, huge potential decision for the city to make. Um, and it's not, you know, no one's necessarily putting anything off, but finding the right amount of time and information before making a decision. 
and trying to weigh, uh, you know, in, input from the community, people living in the area, uh, citizens around it, citizens that might be interested in it, uh, as well as staff input. You know, that's a very good example, I think, of a tricky situation. But uh, ultimately, I, I think that you know, this council is willing and understanding of making those difficult decisions, which we have to do in a timely fashion. It brings up a really a couple of really interesting points. Uh, and Jared talks about uh, about staff bringing the expertise. Um, and what we're able to do is, is insightfully take a look at the recommendations and 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 be able to either accept, reject, or, or help modify those recommendations uh, based on insight uh, and and also based on the ability to go and research the background. Uh, another critique of this council so far has been the amount of time that we might spend debating on some things. Uh, we we were on uh, seven hours uh, the other night. About five and a half of that was was uh, talking about the South Street lands, uh, and we're going to do another two hours uh, on Monday, uh, and then of course we've got to follow that with a council decision. So there's lots of opportunity for for long debates, but we're we're up against the wall. We have to make a decision by the end of the month, one way or the other. Uh, the fact is, though, when we are debating, the debate isn't rehashing questions that are already in the report. They're finding more information. They say, okay, we've got the report here. It says this, this, and this. How does the, that impact the decision if we were to change that factor? Um, it, uh, it's a, the debates are actually fairly academic. Uh, we, we spent uh, three hours. Was it three hours? Or 90 minutes. 90 minutes. Sorry. Let's see. Uh, on the, uh, the wording of, of, um, uh, of approaching our strategic plan and, and future plans through a gender lens. Uh, think about uh, the engineering of the city. Do we always put, uh, do we put the accessibility of all into those things? When we place a bus stop, are we placing it in a really dark and wet spot? Or are we placing that bus stop underneath a, a hydro pole that happens to have a light on it? Uh, some people might be more comfortable in one environment versus the other. A reasonable recommendation. The question was, how do you word that properly so that you don't give the impression that uh, um, that we're we're creating new affirmative action components necessarily? That we're looking for fair and equitable treatment, um, and so that that ninety minute discussion kind of got panned a little bit again in the media. But uh, one of the staff members had called me. The, or we were talking, and he said, "I got to tell you um, that that debate you had about uh, about gender." Uh, it was probably one of the most intellectual discussions I've ever heard in the council horseshoe. Uh, and, and that was nice to hear, because that was the day before the Free Press article came out and said, these guys can't decide anything. They spend 90 minutes arguing about gender. Uh, <laughs> but that's that was the approach, I think. And, uh, and so very interesting components and, and the optics of it. Uh, I think that's the one thing. We've got 11 new people at 15, so we're all kind of learning spin as we go. And, but. Uh, I don't think we want to. I don't think we want to spin too much. We want to be able to put it out there and say, "This is what we're doing. We're working hard." Yeah. Well, I don't think I don't think spin's the case necessarily. I think it's just, you know, as council, you struggle in the sense that you want to make sure that things are done expeditiously and efficiently. Um, but at the same time, you know, I appreciate you know that the mayor typically will say, you know, if we're going to have a discussion about something, let's get all questions out there on the floor first, um, because you know, anytime you're considering making a decision. You want to be able to make a decision in the best way possible. Um, and sometimes that takes a bit more time. Um, but I think at the end of the day, making sure that those all those points, you know, we're not rehashing it. It's just making sure that all the information is there before making that decision. Yeah. And the difficulty, is that the interesting part is fun watching the media try to predict our votes. Uh, <laughs> they used to be able to say eight, seven, eight, seven all the time. We're like uh, uh, three to twelve. We're or seven to eight, or, or four to eleven, and sometimes you know it, it's all over the map, and there's no predictability because we're all coming to it with with uh, fairly open minds. And uh, I've been convinced by council colleagues. I've convinced council colleagues. Staff have changed my mind on stuff, and, and you're, we're really processing the best information that we have, rather than coming with predetermined outcomes. Well, I think that's probably one of the biggest points that you know through the election and now even. Um, that that's just what people. I mean, so the people London wanted, but it's also I think when you want to have you know a government that works in a functional way that's that's successful, um, it's really based off the ability to have multiple inputs and multiple ideas uh, provided at the table and being able to consider all options independently, right? Um, and that is also you know weighing what staff opinions are, what council colleagues' opinions are, and what the citizen input is. And I think you know we've tried to move away from any sort of group thinking or group decision making. Um, and the idea of having 
you know, different votes going different ways. Um, I think that shows the signs of success, success uh, of a good council. And a lot of respect for each other. Yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, we have a, a really a team that uh, that's not disparaging towards each other. Uh, we, we recognize everybody has different points of view and, and spend the time to try and understand those points of view. So, um, we did title this discussion, uh, London and City of Transition. Um, and it kind of gave me, if you don't mind, that brief, yeah, just an opportunity. Steve was talking about the strategic plan before. Um, and, you know, a couple of the big things that came out of it uh, was the city's mission statement as well as our vision statement. Um, and this was sort of a point for me that I had been really thinking a lot about uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, because, especially around the vision for the city, um, and there's always criticism about what that ends up being. Um, but to me, you know, the one thing that we had, the city really did not have for the last decade was any sort of significant direction of where we wanted the city to go. Um, and I think, you know, the city had kind of just been sort of a, not a floundering state necessarily, but just not necessarily having that strong direction. We were a city of opportunity. We were a city of opportunity and, you we know, had a song too. Had before that, you know, back, back in the day, um, you know, we were also all mixed up. Yeah, that's um, right. You know, that was a, a great direction for the city, giving an understanding, trying to say that, you know, we have lots of services the city offers. And trying to aim at multiculturalism, but uh, probably the phrase wasn't the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I prepared just a couple points here, I'll just on this one because I think it's, it's important. But, you know, now with the vision that we have, uh, which is a leader in commerce, culture, and innovation, our region's connection to the world. Um, to me, it really gives a fairly clear direction of where we want the city to go, and it gives clarity not just to us, uh, but to staff and to those uh, in and outside the city, uh, which really want to help make better decisions and direct the decisions that we're going to make for the city. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things was a few weeks ago, uh, we had Hazel McCallion come speak at uh, our panel night about shift transit, uh, our rapid transit initiative. And, you know, probably what intrigued me the most uh, about Hazel speaking um, was her sort of notion that, you know, she was so jealous of London because we weren't next to Toronto. And, you know, that <laughs> completely blew my mind because, you know, just, I think as a municipality, you think, well, all the powers in Toronto and everything's there, so you might as well try and get connected to Toronto. Uh, but for her, it sort of framed it in this very different light for me where it's, we have the opportunity uh, really as, as London to sort of be, I think, this strong regional hub uh, for Southwestern Ontario. Um, you know, Alone, London is a very strong, medium, uh, urban-sized center, uh, probably the largest in southwestern Ontario. Um, but London alone really is not as strong as the region. Um, and that really hit a, a keynote for me, uh, which really pushed me to sort of lead us in the direction for this vision, which I think council definitely appreciated and picked up on. Um, and since then, I know that even talking to staff, um, not speaking for all of staff but at City Hall, um, but they appreciate that now there is a clear direction um, of where we want the city to go and how that could focus our strategic priorities and what we want to do in the future. Um, and, you know, I think a big part of that we looked at, for me, looking at, uh, you know, the mayor bringing uh, the mayors from Sarnia, Stratford, as well as Chamber of Commerce representatives from regions across Southwestern Ontario. Um, you know, London really has this opportunity to collect and connect the strengths of Southwestern Ontario and really be a strong region, um, rather than us being, you know, one city that's competing against many, many other small cities across Southwestern Ontario. You know, when we're looking at uh, working with the provincial government, with the federal government, um, and trying to be successful here in London, you know, London is not nearly as strong as the 2.5 million inhabitants of the entirety of southwestern Ontario. And we don't have all the strengths uh, here in London. I think we're looking to grow those as much as we can. Uh, but making sure that we're connecting with our region and, and supporting one another uh, and collaborating versus fighting with one another, I think really sends a strong message. And I think we're really looking for a, a good direction going there. That's interesting because that kind of segues nicely into the next piece. Uh, because uh, on the macro scale, when we take a look at where London is uh, as a municipality, do we do we sit as an island um, geographically, kind of? Uh, we're, we're a large city with with no ge um, physical boundaries to us. We're not up against a lake. We're not up against another big city. We're not up uh, against a mountain, uh, and and kind of the hub. But do we take a paternalistic approach? As, as that uh, entity uh, and tell the other smaller municipalities around us, thou shalt, uh, and, this, and we're going to lead on these things. No, we're going to work together. And the same thing on the citizen engagement piece on the micro side uh, kind of really comes to light is, is there's been, and this was, goes back to political theory again, the new public admin versus new public service components. Uh, when you took a look at, um, 
and the, the government previous, there was very much a, a, a NPA uh, blindness to it. It was uh, kind of Barry Reagan Thatcher, uh, your taxpayers, your customers, we're going to give you services. Whether you like it or not, we're going to give you services. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, versus the new public service lens, which is seeing citizens as partners in the delivery of services and the creation of services and the vision for the city. Uh, and so there was that disconnect because staff were doing it. Staff were doing it in huge levels, whether that was the uh, Rethink London initiative to redraw the, uh, the official plan of the city, whether it was transit uh, or a couple of the other big ones, the neighborhood, strengthening neighborhood strategies, really very much trying to spend as much time to collaborate uh, and get towards the empowerment side of the spectrum of, of public engagement. However, as soon as it got to the council side of things, it was the lens was very much back to that NPA and the new public at the end lens. Uh, we're going to give you services. We're going to determine how that's going to be done. And we'll listen a little bit, uh, but not a lot. So there's this, this gulf between the administrative and the, and the uh, government arm, uh, the elected arm. And we wanted to try, uh, a lot of us talked, I think almost all of us in our campaigns talked about that component. How do we engage you? How do we, uh, how do we draw that input into shaping? Uh, and Jared had crowdsourced a lot of the, uh, the components of the vision statement of the city. He went out on Facebook and Twitter and talked to people and said what elements and boiled that down and put it in there. So that came up to a really interesting piece because staff and council now were very much want to do this. And we saw in record numbers people in the galleries at budget time and uh, very key strategic decision times of uh, city council. And now the gallery is mostly empty. And so we kind of got to figure out why. Um, it's concerning. Are, are people comfortable? Or are people now feeling disengaged? Or what's the factors behind that? Because now if, if we've come to City Hall with this vision of, of engaging everybody and, and doing collaboration and we can't get people there in the numbers that were there before, then are we really representing uh, the broad population or are we representing a small group? Because I thought it was fascinating that a lot of the events, the, the uh, Rethink events, uh, I'd go to those, and I didn't see what people might derisively call the usual suspects. I saw a lot of people I'd never seen before in my life, which was nice. It was refreshing, because as the president of the Urban League, uh, I, I talked with a lot of very uh, civically active people. But I wanted to see people that, that also weren't that involved traditionally. That's how do you get them to the table? And they, those things were doing it, but now it seems to have dropped off a little bit. So, yeah. no, I think uh, I think that was sort of the last point that we wanted to make before we sort of jumped into discussion. But I think that was sort of us. Um, I think that's been you know an interesting struggle for us on council is you know with the end of the election, you know, the London. I mean, I was it was amazing to see the results of the election. Uh, I mean, I was <coughs> very happy that I got in. Very happy that Steve got in. Um, <laughs> And Josh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it was very clear that at the end of this election, and it worked significantly hard um, to get a different group in council uh, to really lead the city in a different direction and lead it in a different light. Um, but as Steve mentioned, since that's happened, people are, or at least it has seemed that you know we, we're sort of we've got where we are now. Um, but just because the change has happened doesn't mean that the advocacy necessarily needs to stop. Um, and I think we're looking to continue to try and find ways to build that engagement more so and in a more positive and, and partnership way. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we're looking for input on that as well. Um, but I think probably at this point, unless you've got anything else, Steve, I think we've talked for a yeah, amount of time. You know, the contrast was interesting. We had 800 people to our inauguration, which was crazy. Mm -hmm. I, it was overwhelming to come around the corner and see that many people there, all there for an council inauguration to listen to the most boring phrase in, in municipal government repeated 15 times um, <laughs> in our oath of office. Uh, and then when we held our little budget workshops and strategic planning workshops in our community, I had 11 people come up to mine. Um, so, oh, same. yeah. You know, it's great to have 11 people. Uh, it was. Especially on a snowy night. And, and 11, uh, most of them I didn't know too, which was good. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we want to be able to continue to drive it, figure out how to build it. So, that's our stuff, and uh, that leads us to that piece there. So yeah, I'm happy to answer questions about anything. And uh, Jeff Rick doesn't get to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I, uh, I, I nice to see you. And I, yeah, nice to see you guys. And uh, I, I think I'm sort of of the older crowd now. And uh, I, 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 on that last point, um, the whole way Twitter is being used is really, and, and the way I've learned to consume it just in the last six months, has really changed my my sort of approach to things. And in fact, I haven't been to the gallery of City Hall yet with the new council, and I was going bi-weekly with the old council to represent my organization's interests as an agency board and commission. And I just feel so much connect, more connected because I can consume what's going on in Twitter. And whether it, it, it translates into a comfort level for me, and, and I, you know, I have to go, I'll get there, but I wouldn't take that people not being in the audience as a bad sign. I'm consuming it on the online service, which uh, I think Jesse and Josh and, and even you guys are, you know, tweeting at the beginning of the meeting. If you want to follow online, follow online. That's very convenient for me. And I'm getting the, the feedback during the meeting from the Twitter feed, and uh, I feel very engaged, to be quite frank. And, uh, you know, I think that's a challenge, though, because you're not getting it face to face, and there is real. There are different people that engage through Twitter in different ways, so you're not catching everyone. But it's a really neat new tool that you guys use superbly through your election campaigns, and uh, and have been continuing to use. So that's just feedback. Yeah, no, I appreciate that feedback. And I know I always find it. I'm kind of jealous when I look at some people on Twitter. They're like, "Well, I'm not at the meeting today. I'm at home instead of having a beer." Yeah. While watching <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's, "Why can't I do that?" Yeah. 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 I, have a little, I don't drink while I'm watching. <laughs> I'm going to pick up a little more on the engagement piece because I think it's really interesting. Um, I mean, in a sense, I'm, I'm not immediately that worried because, you know, people engage for different reasons. And a lot of people engaged in advance of the election because they were really unhappy with the way that the former council was operating. Um, and uh, so that that's a sort of different motivation from, you know, engaging in order to sort of build some concrete new things. and. And, and so, you know, just because those people aren't necessarily engaging in the same way, to some extent, that I think indicates that, you know, people have a certain faith in and optimism about how the new council is doing its business. But there is still that challenge, right? Because then, as you were saying, Steve, you know, if, if it stays this way, then, you know, you can kind of drift off track and out of touch, right? So, so how is it that you then engage people in a constructive way rather than just inventing their frustrations or their opposition? Um, and I'm wondering in that regard, I remember back in early fall, Josh and I were talked a little bit and he was thinking a little bit about um, ideas for neighborhood advisory boards or councils at the board level in, in London and whether there's been any discussion of that and whether that's some, considered something that might be a sort of viable way to scale down and therefore sort of bring in a certain structure of engagement. I think that was the worry actually because the, the community meeting was supposed to kind of be the first dipping the toe into into that concept of creating a, a work council or at mm. least some sort of quarterly town halls, those kind of components mm. and the, the interest was reform. Um, mm. So it then becomes really incumbent to make sure that, that you go out and pull people in, uh, but you. The, one of the the counter comments I've heard about work councils is that now who are these select people? Right. Uh, so uh, the other the other concern I have is if if we can take the the message perhaps that people have gone a little quiet because they're comfortable with the decisions we're making. Um, that we don't get too comfortable in that message, right? Because that's that's an implicit message. It hasn't been explicitly stated, and uh, and there's some danger in those waters. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, I was also thinking about uh, you know, the engagement side too, and you know, it's true. I have much less interest in going down to watch council work now that I'm much more comfortable with <laughs> the council that's there and. Uh, extrapolating that out, it, it's it's just you know goes back to the good old nimbyism of people are going to get pissed off and they're going to get down there and they're going to show up when they don't want to see something happen. And the problem with that is that you know, like you said, all the way around, you know, you can get off track when you don't have anybody keeping you in check or physically showing up to vent their frustrations or show their opposition. But I've always kind of wondered: is there an opportunity to start thinking about ways to? 
create the proverbial canary in the coal mine? Where can you where can you drop your uh, uh, your sensors in the community to watch when um, you start seeing uh, waves of discontent about certain things kind of pop up? And that's not something that I really have any idea of where to go. With. <laughs> I thought you were going to give us the answer. <laughs> the answer is not just uh, so. That's but the, the idea is something that I think is worthwhile to pursue, and I have no idea. Um, it's an interesting thought. Yeah, I like that concept. Yes, sir. Yeah, a different question. Uh, on the bottom of one of your slides, about feedback with one about uh, present versus multi year presence yeah. or something like that. I guess we should have talked about that instead of just having uh, I mean, it on the slides. About it. I'm a climate change guy. So, how do you actually address the issues of you know, when the next election is like two years ahead? Whatever it is, I've lived here for 15 years, but I still don't know how often you guys. I had to vote for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, four years. Uh, you know, the current budget versus multi year budgets, when you look at things like you're looking at infrastructure, the climate would be different 20, 30, 40 years from now, very differently than it is now, different risks and opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how do you balance those things knowing that you want to get reelected in the next election? That's, uh, <coughs> excuse me. That's a great question. That's I think that's a billion dollar yeah. question. Well, that's, <laughs> that's always a question. I think, you know, uh, there, we want to have the inherent optimism with us that we're doing this for altruistic reasons and we want the best for the city. Um, and I think that's really, you know, what can be of insistence with something like multi year budgeting. Um, because it, you know, we can sort of set some parameters and targets about where we want the city to go. And I think one of the challenges is, is the fact that budgets can be very political oftentimes and you know putting it into a multi-year status I think in some ways takes a bit of that away because we're setting these targets now um, there's opportunity to change in the future um, but I think really getting strong direction and, and trying to leave that so we're not manipulating it uh, down the road as much and trying to give a strong direction for not just the next four years but the next 10 20 years as you say um, I think is really the direction that we're trying to go and I think that you know I remember going through the MBA program that was always one of my biggest struggles was thinking and talking to anybody that was working um, saying, you know, we want to do this program, but we, we know that in two years there's going to be a new council, so who knows what their, you know, direction is going to be. Um, and I think really that is one of the potentials of multi-year budgeting is that there's the potential to try to limit that to some extent. Um, obviously, it's still up to the council of the day to make some changes, um, but I think it, it does give a better, stronger benefit to some of those targets. There's two kind of components to that, I think. One is that we were on single-year budgets before. We're moving to a four-year budget from this point. Uh, but again, that reflects a mandate only. Uh, it doesn't reflect 20, 30 year component. Uh, so again, it, it does create this political opportunism component in, in framing a budget that, that allows us to kind of be a little hands off for the next few years and just kind of revisit it every few years and make sure the assumptions are correct uh, and that the models are still correct. Uh, with respect to, to climate components, uh, the challenge is going to be on infrastructure uh, predominantly, uh, and land use plan. Uh, and uh, we have uh, at least a couple of people who are passionately involved with those things, which uh, which really help to help guide that conversation. And when we talk about the 250-year uh, flood event, is that really now a 50-year or a 10-year flood event? So how has that shifted? How does that uh, affect where we put our flood zones? Do we do a two-zone concept, a flood fringe, those kind of things? Those are huge, massive planning components. Um, I don't think our financial modeling is based so much on that beyond the perhaps the risk to infrastructure that may be within those those realms, and that's a huge component. Uh, so for us, the challenge is going to be as we look at the infrastructure models, and the infrastructure models are at least uh, um, look out on the 20, 30 year horizon, which is is nice and a little more reassuring rather than these in the in the moment one year budgets or four year budgets. Uh, our challenge is to make sure that uh, that we've adequately uh, funded uh, infrastructure replacement and cycling, and that the, those models are factors in developing what our projected costs are going to be. Uh, and, and those are questions we, we get to ask. Um, and if they're not explicitly stated, then we'd say, state them for us. How have you used those considerations? Uh, and and are, are we safeguarded? And why do you think we're safe? So I think, does that answer the question a little bit, or does it skirt around a ton? So, yeah, are we playing politics with it? <laughs> yeah, 
So, I mean, you guys sort of prefaced your comments that, you know, you both have busy day jobs as well, but obviously they allow you some flexibility. Uh, but obviously, you know, you don't know I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're here. Uh, uh, maybe, office. maybe broadcasting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a, just a minute thirty delay, so we we might be able to fix that. Fix it, like down here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm wondering, I guess, you know, from, from your own kind of personal experience with this, but also kind of thinking, maybe in more general terms, we're talking about London as a city in transition. Are we at or nearing a point where becoming or being a municipal councillor is a full-time job and maybe needs to be considered uh, in that way, or are you guys still able to do, uh, you know, as good a job or work at a level that you feel comfortable with? There's two know? answers to this: There's the political answer and the other answer, and I'll give you the other answer. <laughs> uh, this is absolutely a full-time job. I have no question in my mind about it. Uh, I can't say it because a predecessor with the same first name as me was really um, jumping from rooftops about it, saying this is the way to go, uh, and he didn't have a lot of credibility. Uh, but the amount of work, if if I wanted to do this job, really do this job justice, mm -hmm. uh, I could uh, uh, easily fill up full time, if not more, uh, hours of dedication to it. And I'm close to that as it is. Uh, I work 40 hours at work, and then I can do another 30 to 40 hours on the other side. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting day to go um, seven and a half hours at work, hop down the 401, come back here, hop into council and do another seven hours of debate. Mm -hmm. uh, by then, your brain is pretty much scrambled. Uh, the part that falls off a little bit, and this is the part that really concerns me, is the constituency work. Um, we get a lot of emails, and I don't get a lot of time to spend answering them. And when I get to it, I get to it on the weekends. Um, I'm usually pretty done by the end of a weekday, and so I'll find some weekend time to do it. But uh, I think it, it really is time to consider it. The problem is the public hasn't seen a value in that yet. We need to show that there's a value proposition associated with a council that's productive. Mm -hmm. and it is genuinely working for them. If they don't believe that, then they're just thinking this is a, a cushy job. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. I think Steve covered a lot of the points there. And, uh, you know, I'd do my best to counsel not to try and repeat what other people said. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, I, so I had the opportunity uh, before getting into the role of being a counselor to have a part-time job. Um, and in part, I took that job because the recognition that if I was to become a counselor, mm -hmm. um, understanding that the amount of hours that I, you know, had heard I would need to put into it, um, and what I would want to put into it was, you know, anywhere from thirty to fifty hours a week, depending on the week. Um, you know, I think one of our council colleagues has been tracking his hours, um, and specifically, you know, when we're doing the budget, which is a bit more. I mean, it's a fairly hefty week, uh, or well, a couple weeks with that, and a couple heavy days. But you know, there were some weeks where it was sixty hours that he would track. Um, because you have budget plus every other additional meeting you have plus engagements plus constituency work um, and it definitely adds up and I think um, you know Steve made a good point that unfortunately I think the idea of a full-time counselor in the past had been sort of bandied about by someone who was not necessarily doing the job justice in a full-time way um, and and you know it, it does I mean I I'm on seven committees I think um, and some of those committees have subcommittees that you're required to sit on as well. Um, so that adds up a lot of time too. Um, not just uh, the work itself, but travel time and uh, trying to balance it too. And I know Steve didn't necessarily touch on this, and I might be going sort of interfering here, but you know, Steve also has a family. And um, you know, I'm, I'm a young single guy, and I have the opportunity and flexibility a bit more than I think some other people on council. Um, and I know even for myself, trying to balance a part time job and, and the role of council can be challenging. Um, and I think, you know, we look at, uh, I look at someone like Hamilton, which I believe already has uh, full-time counselors, if I'm correct, and, and they, you know, it's a city that's a little bit bigger than London, um, but I think we're sort of in a fairly similar stream in light in terms of directions now and trying to be successful and growing. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, when you're really looking at moving forward, I think you definitely have a good point. I mean, the idea of this being a full-time job, I think, I think it's apparent, and I think, most people I've talked to in the last couple of months, you know, when they ask, how's the job going? Is it stressful? How are the hours, you know? And I haven't had one person that's that's not said to me that it should be a full-time job, um, or at least compensation-wise. Um, and I think it also speaks to the fact that for me, I'm, I'm currently on a contract for my part-time job, and it's probably going to, it may end um, in July or August. And one of the challenges that I look towards is, 
I knew that when I was uh, when I left Stratford to come back to London to, to run for city council because I <coughs> didn't think it made sense to be working for the mayor at Stratford and being city council in London. Um, you know, it, it was it, I got back to London and trying to find a job when people knew that I was running for city council. I had a really difficult time. People saying, "Well, no, you're not going to have enough time to do this job." And even though it's a part-time job, I said, oh, "I could do it, no problem." But people wouldn't necessarily believe me. Um, and I'm concerned, you know, in six months' time that I may be not have that job anymore. And the challenge I'm going to face with is your city council. So now it's not just the time, um, but there's also the conflict of interest aspect, which I think, you know, when you know people are already in certain roles, um, that's okay, and you and you deal with what you have. And I think people understand that component of it. Um, but I think as an employer, I can appreciate that if I was going to be hiring someone, if there's a lot of barriers to that person being able to do the job in the fulsome way that they could, um, I'm even to hire them. So I think that also poses some additional challenges. Consider the conflict the other way too, because you've got people that are working out in the community uh, and have interests, pecuniary, direct pecuniary interests by working in the community, and then uh, having to represent uh, issues at council that may cross paths with what your day job is. It's one of the reasons I work in Oxford County and not Middlesex County, because emergency services are a third of the city's budget. <laughs> uh, so it would pose a, a fairly interesting uh, uh, quagmire for me if, uh, if I worked here or not there. Appreciate the question. Yeah, I got um, you, might be you might be convincing me on the full-time uh, counselor business. Um, <laughs> Just on the conflict of interest, you've got to think about the temporal aspect of it too. That if you're a full time counselor, uh, you've got to look to some job in the future. You might well have a conflict of interest because you're thinking about some job after your uh, counselor. So I don't know if it affects the counselor. But it, what I really wanted to say was uh, uh, that I think I'm the, I am the only person in the room that was around when we were designing the MPA. And uh, uh, we didn't design it uh, for uh, people to get elected to council, we didn't design it for, for politicians. And uh, so this is a pleasant unintended consequence if you think it was uh, useful. Um, so I said, and it's very gratifying always to have you know, some successful students come back and tell you know, great things that you were doing. But my question really is about training for municipal councillors because you may or may not know that in Quebec it's now a requirement uh, that councillors take courses, uh, including on ethics. And uh, there's a woman at the Political Scientist University of Ottawa who uh, is studying this, and I've sort of been connected with her, and uh, I'm trying to, uh, Josh knows about this, I'm trying to do something about uh, training and orientation for, for counselors. So my, my, I might want to come back to you on this, uh, but my question is, what uh, kind of uh, training or orientation did you get uh, and would it have been uh, enough if you hadn't already had an, M an MPA? So uh, this year, as far as my understanding goes, was the first time really um, that staff uh, with the mayor had put together a, a orientation package or orientation sessions for council. Um, and it, you know, it did a good job, I think, at covering sort of a little bit around the basics of you know the, the role and function of a councilor, you know, what your day-to-day -day activities might be. Um, dealing with the media, um, you know, going through the budget cycle, how that's going to go, um, what some challenging questions are, but I don't. It doesn't necessarily through. You know, it was I think it was three, uh, four or five hour sessions. I think there's those sessions, and then at the beginning of our committee meetings for the past uh, two months, they've been taking chunks of the uh, the concepts within those committees and saying. Uh, we're going to tell you about development applications. We're going to tell you about, um, and really not voting items. There, these are just educational and inter informational components, so that we could learn the components of our job. So those have definitely been helpful. Um, even you know, I, I can say this to anybody. Even though I've done the MPA and I've worked with the City of Stratford, and you know, had that experience working for the development industry for a little while. Um, you know, even those experiences, you know, there's still always more to learn, uh, you know, especially in any organization, especially one of the size of the City of London. Um, it's very complex and many different services. But I think, getting back to your point, Andy, um, you know, it's interesting, like groups like AMO um, currently already offer um, some paid for training. Um, and I know that they are sort of offering things that didn't necessarily, for me, um, having gone from the I didn't necessarily see them as that interesting. I will say though, that I think there's been quite a few people on council who didn't necessarily have the training that, that we had um, that would look for some sort of programs like that. And I do think 
um, that it's really important for anybody that's coming to be on a council, on municipal council, to have some better training and education before getting into the role. Because I think otherwise, you get in there and it can be a bit of a trial by fire. Well, and that was an interesting point too, right? Because we come with a, a very heavy academic uh, understanding of the workings and machinations of, of municipal government. And then there are a lot of opportunities, as, uh, as Jared had said, even through all of this, to uh, whether that's at council and delivered by our city or by Emil uh, to understand. But uh, I found those to be fairly um, not anywhere close to comprehensive, I guess. Uh, I've I brought more knowledge than I've gained through those components. Um, and I think there are absolutely is more opportunity to, to improve that. Uh, but the, what's the difference between an MPA and a master's level education versus uh, um, uh, a couple of week long courses or something like that that a uh, council would get? It's interesting you bring up Quebec because I was thinking about the, uh, the there's a master's program at the University, University de Quebec in Montreal uh, had developed uh, after the Quiet Revolution uh, a very strong public administration program for provincial. Administrators and that they're sending as many as they can through that because they wanted to see a strong, strong public admin uh, in in the uh, provincial sector. So I think Quebec kind of gets it uh, on those levels. Uh, ironically enough, the, some of the biggest corruption pieces happened in Montreal well, and Laval. That, that's, exactly, <laughs> well, that's exactly why they have the compulsory ethics. Yeah. It comes out of all the uh, corruption pieces. <laughs> So uh, I think we're out of time. Unless, oh, Josh, is there something quick online that we should? Uh, uh, bring no, up? I just said. Uh, oh, and just for your for for a note, uh, the city clerks are watching this, and um, <laughs> and, and and they told no, me Kathy, that we haven't come up with policy yeah, ideas. That, that, <laughs> for the record, this this was not the first orientation that was done. Um, however, uh, um, uh, my thoughts on the uh, on the orientation. Um, I, I think at this time it might have been a little bit different, and and the interesting thing is, was it by uh, how much of it was by necessity because of the amount of turnover um, in this particular council? I know that uh, last time uh, uh, my predecessor in the ward, uh, Matt, um, uh, didn't have a, a huge orientation. In fact, he he ended up calling the city manager about three weeks after the election to ask if he should be coming in and doing something, and and <laughs> and, and it's not the current city manager, um, but but. But it's because you know in that group he there were a lot of colleagues that he could he could get help from. In this case, I know some of the things that we did, uh, and and maybe I'll give a shout out to the clerks because I know they're watching. Um, we did things like practice voting, um, like actually being able to sit down, dealing with a matter that was already dealt by council, and figure out how the equipment actually works so that we can we can actually make logistical effective decision making. So there was the content piece, but there was also the process piece, which may be oriented more by necessity of having a large turnover. Than, than by um, uh, than by uh, you know design um, because otherwise for how to vote if ever, if you're the only new person on council you maybe just ask the person beside you but if the two people beside you have never used the equipment before either then um, then then you need a little bit of a different thing so there might have been a by necessity component to some of the orientation that would be different depending on who gets elected. Yeah. Well, we are out of time, but thank you for a great presentation, a very interesting presentation, and a lively discussion. I hope everybody found it as fascinating as I did, and that uh, it is is uh, really great to see uh, you know, two of our grads taking such a strong role in helping to lead the city. And uh, um, it's a it's it's a good example and a great story. And, uh, we'll be watching what you're doing. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. Thanks.